Good evening and welcome to Q&A. I'm Tony Jones. Joining us tonight for a closer look at Australia's refugee policy, the architect of the federal government's sovereign borders strategy, retired General Jim Molan. The founder of GetUp's No Business in Abuse campaign and this year's Gribble Argument author, Shen Narayanasamy. The director of the University of New South Wales Calder Refugee Law Centre, Professor Jane McAdam. ACU law professor Frank Brennan, who believes refugee advocates should accept the government's mandate to stop the boats. And former refugee turned successful businessman and philanthropist Hugh Trong. Please welcome our panel. Now, unfortunately, uh, Khalid Koza, who was flying from Europe to join the Q&A panel, had to cancel his trip at the last minute for uh, family and emergency reasons. Uh, Q&A is live on ABC TV in New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. It's live everywhere else on News 24 and at 9.35 Eastern Daylight Time. Or you can watch and listen live on iView, Facebook and News Radio. Well, our first question tonight comes from Thomas Giesekamp. Uh, turning back the boats saved lives. Offshore detention and processing gave the Australian government time to do their checks. Now that the offshore detention centres are closing and the remaining refugees are not allowed into Australia, how can we be humanely resettled overseas? Jim Mullen. Uh, that, that's a good question. That's a question which I think everyone is concerned with at the moment. Uh, uh, we have set in place a process that has worked. Every Australian should be extraordinarily proud of not just 50, 70, 80 years of, of migration policy, but what Operation Sovereign Borders has achieved. Uh, there are choices for those on Nauru and Manus, and those choices are, if you're a refugee, then you settle in those countries or other countries that will take you. If you're not a refugee, you go home. In the meantime, we should treat those people with the respect and the security and the safety that they deserve. So, Jim, did you ever envisage uh, that people with legitimate refugee camps would be stuck indefinitely in offshore detention centres? Uh, we always knew that the offshore processing part and, and uh, Operation Sovereign Borders was based on three factors. The first was stopping the boats, the second was temporary protection visas and the third was offshore processing. We always knew that offshore processing would be the hardest part of what we had to do. Shen. Well, I think to say something has worked, it can't include the <coughs> institutional abuse of men, women and children. And I think the problem that we've got now is that what we're doing currently, which is, as you've just pointed out, keeping people in offshore detention for years on end in a way that's completely unlawful and obviously exposes them to abuse, is the only way possible for this country to deal with the small number of people who come here by boat. And I think the problem that we've got is that what the entire context that um, Jim Nolan is talking about relies on is the Australian public not knowing one clear fact. And that is that over the last 15 years in Australia, we have seen the highest proportionate intake of immigrants this country has seen. In the year 2013, when many of these people who arrived by boat came, 25,000 in fact, we had 800,000 people coming through our arrival terminals in our airports every single day. So when you think about that and when you understand the context of that, that's 2,300 people coming every day. You ask yourself, is the only way to deal with a proportionately smaller number of people coming in a dangerous way to imprison them for years on end in a remote... Shen, I, we're going to come back to that issue with some questions from the floor, but let me just ask you this quick one because it was built into the premise of, uh, of Audrey's uh, question there. Um, do you accept uh, the premise that uh, turning back the boat save lives? Well, I think part of the problem is we don't have all of the facts. If you've got a situation oh. where... If you've got a situation where there is incredible secrecy about Operation Sovereign Borders, where you have doctors taking the government to the High Court because of the levels of secrecy and inability that they have to tell their case about what's really happening to the Australian public, I think the problem is, is we don't really know. But what I can posit as a possibility is, if we understand that someone coming on a leaky boat is fundamentally dangerous, which I think we all can, then you've got to ask the question, pushing that boat back from Australian waters 
into the open sea but somebody else's waters, is that likely to be any more safe? And I don't think that answer is adequately been... Let's, let's, hear, let's hear from the rest of the panel. And uh, Frank Brennan, I'll go to you first. Well, I'd start by saying, Jim, I'm not a proud Australian on this at all. That's that... a shame, Frank, a real shame. Well, I'll tell you, I'm very ashamed, and I'll explain why. Basically, what happened in 2013, yes, there were lots of boats coming. And Rudd, as Prime Minister, said, we're going to stop this. So he cut a deal first with Papua New Guinea. And as you know, the idea was at Papua New Guinea that single men would be sent to Papua New Guinea. He then cut a separate deal with Nauru. And the idea was that people, including women and children, would be sent to Nauru. And as you know, Jim, the Memorandum of Understanding negotiated with Nauru and signed off on was very different from the one from PNG. Why? Because what it said was this. It said, right, Nauru is a country of only 10,000 people. We Australians think we've got a big problem. We're going to ship people off to Nauru. And here we are, three years on, the majority of those on Nauru are now proven refugees, OK? They've established their claim. Under the Memorandum of Understanding, what was agreed was this. Nauru said under the MOU, each year we will indicate how many people we can absorb. And the rest of the caseload, Australia will share the responsibility for finding somewhere to resettle them. And furthermore, those who are found not to be refugees, then Australia would share the responsibility if those people couldn't be safely returned home, then Australia would share the responsibility to settle them. So I will be a proud Australian after three years of this if we can get to the stage where our major political parties say, look, three and a half years on, we've had enough of this. The boats have stopped, but basically it's time for these people to be resettled. And the other thing, if I may, I don't want to go on too long, but Briefly. one other point. As you know, Jim, 2012 expert panel set up by Angus Houston, who you would respect greatly, head of the military forces, Michael Lestrange, who'd been the head of DFAT, they said at that stage you could not safely and legally turn back boats. Houston knew you couldn't safely turn back boats then. Lestrange knew you couldn't do it legally. <laughs> now, what we've got now is government saying it can be done. It's been well, done. Well, <laughs> it's been done numerous times and safely. therefore, why, why do we continue to keep proven refugees who are children after three years on the roof? I'm just going to let no you go. Yeah, no, I'll, let, I'll let Jim Mullen... So much of that was directed to you, I think you should respond Thank to you. It. Thank you. Thank uh, you. There, there, there really is no desire at all from anyone I've spoken to, pretty well in either party, to hold people on, these, on, on either of those two islands. The whole idea is to get them off and to move them somewhere else. We don't so, know. Uh, Jim, what about the New Zealand idea? Because they did actually but offer to take th some th of these They people. did, and during Howard's time, they took 150 yeah. of them. So was uh, that a mistake? No, I, I, uh, no I don't know. Uh, none of us really know the reason for that. I can, only, I can only suspect that the reason was that in three years' time after they go to New Zealand, they, come to, they, they have the right to come to Australia. So you, you are then handing to a people smuggler somewhere in Java something to sell. And that's what we've got to avoid. There are 14,000 people waiting in Java for a sign of weakness when they... Uh, if those good people who are seeing... who are trying to weaken our border protection at the moment, uh, the prob We tried this before. We tried it in 2008. It did not work then. It's okay. unlikely right. to work now. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to go to someone who actually did come here on a boat. Um, so, Hugh, um, did you weaken our border security? Obviously, Tony. Um, that's why. I've, um, look, you know, I, I will come to the, the the personal experience in a moment, but I, I find this whole discussion a really sort of sad discussion. Um, it sort of just feels like it's our version of the Trump Mexican wall, you know, that uh, that we put up um, uh, to to handle what's a, a very small uh, um, uh, number of people. You know, we spent ten billion dollars, Jim, over the course of the last three years. When you look at the budgetary pressures that we have, it's an enormous amount of money for you know to so-called stop stop the boat. Surely there were, there, and and will be better ways to uh, to to do that. Um, and uh, you know, personally, I don't think um, stopping the boats in the way that we have have personally that in any way has advanced the country's cause. 
uh, in terms of um, you know our our overall security, um, uh, the our economic cause in terms of getting people into the country who really want to make a contribution, um, and. Uh, and you know when I think about and 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 it seems like a temporary solution because as soon as uh, um, it's a, it's a billion one and a half billion dollars I think if I look at the budget papers that we'll have to keep spending every year just to maintain this this solution so it's it's a really expensive but getting back to Tony's question about our experience coming in, um, yeah so we came in 1978 we were uh, we escaped from Vietnam post Indochina War uh, sort of Vietnam War and part of the Indochinese uh, uh, wave of refugees. Um, uh, we made our way from uh, Saigon down through Malaysia, Singapore, across to uh, uh, Indonesia and then tried to get across to Darwin on three different occasions. And on each occasion our boat took in too much water and we ultimately had to turn around and my father then, who had a smatter of English, wrote a letter to the Australian Embassy in, U um, in Jakarta and then we ultimately got processed by uh, UNHCR um, out of a ref refugee camp there and then came out to Australia. Now, so I have enormous sympathy about um, not having people hop onto boats unnecessarily. Now, we knew the risk, but the risk of persecution in Vietnam for, uh, um, uh, my father was a Chinese heritage business person, so all his former colleagues were getting sent to re-education camps. So the risk of staying um, versus getting onto a boat, you know, if you were faced with that a real choice to make, I almost guarantee, particularly if you're a parent, that you know which choice you're going to you make. You'll take the risk and you'll, you'll get on that boat. So, um, uh, so we took that risk, but I think now that there's probably a better solution to, to, to do that. So uh, then tend to have people get on boats. In Jakarta, we, we were in the camp for about three months. Uh, we got them processed very efficiently. Uh, we had a, a, a couple of countries in which we could uh, go to and we ended up coming to Australia. And I think our family um, and our extended family have since made a solid contribution to, uh, to Australia. And I'd, I'd love to think that, uh, in fact, that you know, um, uh, uh, people uh, now who, who have that choice to make and then um, get accepted by Australia um, will become the most fiercely loyal Australians and then make a contribution that way. And I can't for the life of me understand why we are taking the approach that we are taking. Um, there, are, there will be, if we turn our minds to a better way of, of stopping people taking and, those And risks. what is that, Hugh? What's the better way? I'm sure we're going to get to that, Tony, in due course. Well, we, we will. We, <laughs> come on. It, it, it's, it's probably best that we allow the discussion to unfold, Jim, yeah. in that regard. But I've heard from Jane McAdam. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll hear from you quickly, and we've got another question, a video question, in fact. Thanks, Tony. I think the first thing to do here is to reframe the discussion. We shouldn't be framing this constantly as a security issue about how we shut down our borders and deter people, how we contain them, but rather how do we facilitate safe, lawful uh, pathways for people who, as Hugh just said, are desperately in need of assistance. I think, as he said, we would like to hope that if we ever found ourselves in the same position, that we wouldn't be turned away as we desperately need protection. The other point I'd make here is Hugh mentioned the, the costs. In 2013 to 14, Australia spent the same amount of money on um, offshore processing, Operation Sovereign Borders and the like for a few thousand people as the whole UN Refugee Agency had to care for, at that time, some 50 million displaced people. That is the kind of money that we are spending to stop people who need safety and assistance from getting it. And instead, that money could be so much better spent in, uh, to, to assist people to actually find safe ways to bring them here. And there are very, I mean, we will get to those alternatives, I'm quite sure, but a very simple one would be this. Australia imposes carrier sanctions on airlines that bring people here without a visa. In the Mediterranean, it's 35 euros for people to safely get on a ferry and cross that, uh, that stretch of water, but they're paying up to 10,000 US dollars to engage people smugglers precisely because uh, the, the ferries will be uh, penalised financially if they bring people who don't have the right paperwork. Now, that is something that could be stopped tomorrow, but of course, governments have decided they don't want to do that. There are many other alternatives. We'll come back to that. To and I'm just going to give Jim 30 seconds yeah. to and, uh, and just... Uh, you wanted to jump in and respond. Please do, because we'll, do it quickly. Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joan mentioned this, that we need a safe, lawful path pathway. Well, of course, we've got one. 
We've got a safe, lawful pathway for 13,750 people each and every year. We're about to expand that to 19,000 people that goes on and on and on. Not just one off, but each and every year. There is a safe, lawful pathway sure, to come to Australia and it's being exercised but, each and but every Jim, day. we're facing a once-in-a-lifetime, a once-in-a-generational uh, displacement crisis if you look at the numbers worldwide. And Australia has barely increased its resettlement intake in the last uh, you know, decades. OK, we're going to come to that. Yeah. We're going to go to our next question. It's a video from uh, Dr Anya Neistat from Amnesty International in London. For the last 15 years, I've worked in conflict and crisis areas, including Syria and Afghanistan and Chechnya and Yemen. Uh, and I've seen a lot of suffering that people are subjected to in these places. I was recently in Nauru, and I have to say that uh, the situation for refugees there is one of the worst I've seen in my life. Now that uh, the whole world essentially knows about the devastating effect that this policy has on physical and mental health of people in Nauru and Manus, we all know about suicides, attempted suicides, self-immolations, self-harms, the incidents that are daily occurrence uh, in those places. So the question is, does the success of this policy depend on subjecting people to these enormous levels of suffering and essentially keeping them hostages in Nauru and in Manus Island. Well, Jim, I'll go back to you straight away. Thank you. Uh, I haven't been to Nauru. Uh, I have been to Manus and I've been to uh, uh, refugee camps all over the world and I am absolutely astonished at that. If you go to... if I, uh, I, I have seen enough information to convince me that if you go to Nauru, you will find the most in, in extraordinary medical facilities that most Australian towns would give their right arm for. Anna uh, may have seen terrible things throughout the world. Uh, if I compare it to Manus, uh, uh, we should be... We are so far ahead of refugee camps throughout the world compared to Manus Island uh, that it's not funny. So I, I, I challenge what Anna said. Shen. Well, I think the, the best response is actually of the corporations who were tasked with running these camps. Now, currently at this present time, even though they stand to make millions, Jim, millions, as you well know, from running these camps, every single corporation is pulled out. And do you know why? Because they can't stomach it anymore. And because if they keep in those camps, as we well know, as I talk to every single major bank across the world who are funding these companies, they all said to us, the Evidence is overwhelming. So you might believe not having seen Nauru what you believe, but unfortunately, and in the kind of conversation that we can have with banks, the evidence is overwhelming. And let me tell you... Sorry, I, I think we should uh, just let, 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 let um, the conversation let, let, unfold. Let me sure. make, sorry. No, I'm talking to the audience. Oh, right, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> let me make one comment, uh, and, and that is that uh, uh, what, what, we're, what we've seen with the companies... Uh, is very, very interesting. Your perception is that they're so disgusted with the whole thing, perhaps the pressure that you put on them forced them to leave. But you, well, it may have, but may you know have. what? Yes. What kind of pressure is that? Stacking an entire stack of reports from every single international organisation, from doctors, from nurses, from teachers, from whistleblowers, across the board, and on the table. <laughs> if that's pressure then I think what we're talking about here is pressure coming from real evidence and real facts. And do you know what, Jim? I enjoyed those conversations. Do you know why? Because sitting across the table and having a discussion about facts and policy and evidence is far preferable than the discussion we're having, which is largely about slogans and rhetoric. There are um, alternatives. OK. They need to applaud every statement that Thank you, you enjoy. Thank Otherwise, you, Tony. we'll be applauding all night. Uh, I, 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 I don't. I, I don't. I don't see uh, uh, the, the, the holding of people on Manus and Nauru is not the issue. And I've never met, as I said before, I've never met anyone in our system who wants to hold them there for one second longer. Uh, I think when's the last one finished? In 2018. Who knows what happens? between now yes. and 2018. Uh, perhaps there will be no need for either of the two islands to be functional by 2018. Let's uh, go to the other side of the panel and uh, I'll go back to you, Hugh, and uh, I'm just wondering um, your reflection. You didn't spend a long time at all uh, in camps. Could you imagine um, doing that? Uh, in fact, 
the situation of being in Well, I was just listening to that exchange and, and, you know, what dawned on me is the quality of a camp is not necessarily measured by whether it's medical facilities or what have you. It's actually the sense of hope and direction that comes out of it. So it, you could be in a five-star luxury hotel, but if you feel like you're locked in and you're not going anywhere and you have no idea when you, you, you'll leave, um, I think the, the, the despair and, and the depression that would be associated with that would far outweigh living in a, in a, in a camp that I can recall in, in Jakarta where there was no uh, 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 real um, infrastructure that I can sort of really call. You know, we'd go out uh, hunting toads and frogs at night time to, you know, to cook in meals, but it was a sense of hope. We knew that we, with, within weeks and months we were being processed and we knew where we were uh, uh, going. And, and that was worth more than anything, if, you know, relative to the physical comforts that, that a camp might produce. So just uh, to reflect on that, um, living indefinitely without hope of coming to the country you were aiming for, um, what, what effect would that have? I, I couldn't imagine the trauma that would come with that, uh, Tony. I, I think we um, we've had dealt with some significant trauma in making a decision to to leave uh, Vietnam, to get on the boat, to, to uh, navigate certain waters. Um, but the thing that kept us going was this sense of hope and, and, and being able to uh, restart our life in a safe country or with safe haven. Um, and, and particularly for the adults uh, on the boat um, uh, and, and uh, for them, and the, I could see the anxiety that mum and dad were going through. Um, so to, to end up in a place like the, the camps that were described here, um, with no uh, prospect of any uh, future, I but think that's, would be But that, Hugh, that's not true, because these good people have a choice. If they're refugees, they have the choice of making a life in Nauru or PNG or some other country. The only choice they don't have is to come to Australia. If they're not refugees... Do you know of any other country that's prepared home? to take them? Cambodia. <laughs> they're just not prepared to go. Well, for good reason. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, there's a very uh, good reason why of um, those who've uh, gone there. Well, the majority, well and, yeah, and, and the, one of the very good left. reasons why is because uh, of an error that was made, in my humble view, during the Howard years, when uh, uh, people from Nauru and Manus were finally allowed to come to Australia. That's fine, except it gives hope to each and every person who's on Nauru and Manus now that if they don't take the options that are there, and they have options, if they don't take those options, then the Aussies are weaken and they'll get to Australia. All right, we're going to go uh, broader now. The next question is from Larry Vincent. After World War II, the world came together and organised the placement of millions of refugees in new countries. They were transported by ship and plane, not left to find their own way by paying people smugglers to give them a place on a rickety boat. What is stopping the world organising the placement of refugees again in this organised way? More specifically in our region, isn't the answer to the refugee influx that Australia work in conjunction with UNHCR to process refugees in Indonesia? OK, we'll start with Frank Brennan. A great question. And I think you're right. What's different is we're now a very globalised world and, as Jane has said, I think 60 million displaced people in the globe. And the question is how to affect good outcomes with those flows. Now, if I might go back to Hugh's story. Uh, when Hugh's family came here, there were about 2,000 Vietnamese who arrived directly in Australia by boat. Where Australia was generous was not in receiving people who arrived by boat, but rather, like with your family, went to the embassy in Jakarta or whatever, there was a bipartisan approach by the Australian politicians to say that what we need is a regional response. We don't need to deal with this at our coastline. It's better for everyone, particularly the dignity of those in flight, that we build on a regional response and we show that we are generous. And you are absolutely right. What we've got to do, we need a transparent bipartisan arrangement with Indonesia. We also need one with Malaysia. That then becomes the building blocks for a regional agreement where we have UNHCR and IOM at the table. And then we can have arrangements in place where there is no need for people to risk getting on boats and there can be a proper, secure dealing with people 
as they make their way towards Australia. Jane. I agree. I think the long-term goal is absolutely to be building protection capacity wherever we can. And certainly within our region, that's where Australia um, could have a very positive contribution. But I think we've, we've lost a lot of credibility in recent years. And to be trying to advocate for other countries to build their own um, ability to assist people and to protect them requires a far more humble approach on Australia's part, a willingness to engage and to listen to the issues that concern those countries, and to take a holistic approach, recognising that building regional protection is certainly very, very important, but that's going to take time. And we don't sit back and wait for that to happen and do nothing in the meantime. So it's about modelling good practices. It's about engaging in a, an open, genuine way. And it's also about, once again, looking to the broader international context. Can I just interrupt you just for sure. one moment? Because Khalid Koza, who wasn't able to join us tonight, makes the case that the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention needs to be completely overhauled. And he thinks Australia should take a key role um, in making that happen or pushing for that debate uh, on a global front. Is, is the Refugee problem, uh, Convention part of the problem? I think the Refugee Convention has a lot of... Um, is, is often seen as responsible for a whole lot of things that it was never actually designed to do. So the Refugee Convention was never meant to be a document that would somehow manage international migration flows. It wasn't meant to be a population management tool. It was devised in the aftermath of the worst displacement the world had ever witnessed by people themselves. They were members of, of or representatives of governments, but many of them themselves had been displaced as refugees during the war. And they understood a, th a thing or two about what refugees need to be able to build a dignified future um, within a, a new home. So the Refugee Convention has been a very flexible and dynamic instrument over time. The biggest um, deficit it has was recognised from the start. The then UN Secretary General said it really needs to have a um, responsibility sharing mechanism in it, an, an allocation mechanism and states weren't prepared to accept it's it. It's one of the problems here, and, uh, and I'll, I'll come to the rest of the panel on this, but just to finish uh, Khaled Koza's point, and then we can uh, move on. Um, he argues that this global crisis that we're seeing, it's compounded by what he says, the reality that a significant number of those seeking asylum are not found to be genuine refugees. He cites UNHCR figures in 2012. 700,000 uh, people applied for asylum, only 30% were found to be refugees? Well, it depends where you're talking about. I mean, in, an, in Australia and in PNG and Nauru, the figures are up around 90% and have been consistently for a very long time. And I think that's one of the, the great tragedies of the system we have, is that we're not turning away um, people who are simply setting out in search of a better life. We are turning away people to whom we not only have legal responsibilities, but people who need protection. They, they are people that are, have as I said, not set out on a world tour, but have set out because they are desperately trying to find a place where they can live a dignified existence. All right, I'm going to go across to uh, Jim. The uh, Khalid Koza thing on the Refugee Convention, um, is that tie do you think that is a it needs to be reformed and is that part of the argument or discussion we should be having? I haven't dealt with it for a couple of years. When I was dealing with it, uh, I accepted it for what it was and found ways to do what we were doing, that is... Uh, each and every year to bring successfully 13,750 people to Australia under the humanitarian program. And that is the safe, lawful pathway that we should be concentrating on. Now, uh, at the time, 70% of the people supported us. They weren't concerned about the refugee uh, convention. Larry made a point about... Uh, I think it was Larry, apologies uh, if it was Larry. Uh, Larry made a point about setting up processing it in... Was uh, Larry, yeah in, in uh, Indonesia and back into Malaysia. Uh, uh, Frank said, uh, Larry, you're totally right. I think, Larry, you're totally wrong. The consequences of doing that and the practicalities of doing that are absolutely appalling for the simple reason that we are guaranteeing people to get to... Indo if you get to Indonesia, we'll look after you, put you on a bus and a train and a plane, get you to Australia quite safely. The consequences would be that the vast majority of 20 million refugees will come our way. So, now, can I just... The, the, Jim, the, can the, I just the confirm... The point is that uh, Australians sorry. will not accept that. Okay, Jim, does that mean that a regional solution is not on the cards? We've got a regional point. solution. It just happens to be a region that some people on this, on this panel, I suspect, But most people like. identify a regional solution as being 
uh, a big regional processing centre somewhere. Ah, and this come back, comes back to our Vietnamese experience. The Vietnamese experience is critical to how Operation Sovereign Borders work. Frank was quite right. Of the 60,000 Vietnamese that were accepted by Australia as refugees, 2,100 only came by boat. 3% came by boat. The reason that they all didn't come by boat was that they were slaughtered in the seas of Vietnam by pirates, by faulty boats, by people smugglers and by, uh, by storms. Uh, and the region got so sick of this, UNHCR agreed with Vietnam to put people into the big camps. Galang was probably one of them. Uh, and from there, we had an orderly processing system which brought the other 97% of our good Vietnamese down into Australia. That's exactly what Operation Sovereign Borders is designed to achieve, an orderly okay. process. All right, let's hear it, Shen. I mean, that, that's just completely incorrect. What the Vietnamese experience shows us is that the way you react to people dying at sea is by setting up a situation so they don't have to get on a boat. You don't react to it by pushing boats back into seas and, and, and putting children and families inside detention camps. A previous now, government wait, tried can, that can and I, they failed. No, well, can I, can I bring a point to you, you, Jim? So, right now, we have Ali. Ali is a Syrian citizen. Ali has brothers in Sydney because we come from all the nations in the world in Australia and many of us have family still back in home countries. Ali has Syrian family in Sydney. Citizens there for years had kids here, part of this country. Now, he can see in Syria that war is about to start. So what does Ali do? He applies through the formal safe pathways for family reunion to Australia. And do you know what the waiting list in our immigration program is at the moment for that family reunion? It's 30 years. So he can't get in through that way. So he tries again. He tries to do a student visa for his son. But because they are coming from a war-torn region, he is flagged by the immigration department and he can't even pay for a university place for his son. He's an engineer, so he tries to apply through skilled migration visas. Now, mind you, this is the 800,000 other people coming I'm, to this country. I'm not country. too sure where this so, is going. Well, yeah. right, uh, I'll uh, tell you where it's going. So what happens is... He's blocked in every other way. Yeah. So what does he do when bombs rain on his house? He gets on a boat, he puts his hands into the lives of a people smuggler and he comes here and he runs straight into Operation Sovereign Borders and that man is now spending the last three years on Manus Island. Now, you tell me whether that's a policy failure or policy success. Uh, it is a policy success, ladies and gentlemen, because 1,200 people died when we tried to do it in a separate way. 1,200 people died. The greatest human right we can give to these people is to be alive. OK, is Frank, alive? Frank, Frank, Brennan wants, is alive. Frank Brennan wants to jump in. Go ahead. Just on your question about the Refugee Convention, could I make three quick yep. points about it? One is that neither Indonesia nor Malaysia is a signatory to the Refugee Convention and never will be. So building a regional response in this part of the world, the Refugee Convention is not as significant as it might be elsewhere. Second point. Refugee Convention was drawn up in 1951 before most of the real powerful human rights instruments. So there are no review mechanisms in it. There's no regular reporting by countries. So it's weak in that regard. But the third and most significantly, the Refugee Convention does not deal with things like civil war and humanitarian disasters. And when you look at the 50... 60 million displaced people in the world today, it's not that they're necessarily refugees fleeing because they're being persecuted. Rather, they, like all their neighbours, are the victims of civil war. They're the victims of humanitarian disaster. And therefore, what the world is being called to, particularly first world countries like ourselves, is the generosity because we have secure borders, because we've got wealth, because we've got the rule of law, to be doing our part in terms of humanitarian assistance well beyond what's there in the Refugee I'm, Convention. I'm going to... Uh, the next question will allow everyone to respond anyway, so I'm going to go to Terry Westaway. Go ahead. OK. Australia is in debt up to its eyebrows. We've got no possibility of paying it off anywhere within the foreseeable future. Refugees that we get, uh, well, um, not likely to be, um, they're lot, well, sorry, they are likely to be welfare dependent for a long time into the future, if not 
permanently. Sorry. Where are we to get the money and the resources to look after the current refugees and any future refugees? All right, we'll start with you. <laughs> Terry, um, Paid thank any you. Taxes lately? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that uh, assessment. Um, <laughs> you know, um, look, uh, clearly when you read some of the reports, there are um, refugees, like every segment of the population, who uh, um, have may either temporary or on a medium-term basis uh, dependent on some welfare. But certainly, by, certainly the people I, I come across, and, and whether it's my family or, or, or extended family, I don't think our family has ever taken one welfare check, to be honest. Um, you know, when we first came, mum and dad found a job straight away, straight after the initial settlement, um, and they've been working in a factory for the last 30 years. Uh, and then, you know, I've been involved in starting three businesses and, and others and employed, uh, created jobs. And, and yes, you might say, um, OK, well, that was one segment of the refugees that came from, you know, Chinese background. Um, I'm now involved in, in a, uh, another uh, organisation that uh, some colleagues and I have uh, started. Uh, where we're um, creating um, uh, uh, loans uh, uh, to refugees to start businesses. And uh, re recently I went out and visited six businesses that have all started by refugees that have arrived in the last three or four years. Um, and I've got to say that the work ethic and the motivation to actually get ahead and come off any dependence on welfare um, is uh, probably, a, you know, uh, uh, exceptional. Um, these people working, you know, 15, 16 hour days, six, seven, six, seven days a week, starting businesses and actually creating jobs. So um, far from perhaps being a, um, uh, uh, a long term drain on, on, on Australia's budget uh, uh, expenditure, um, uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that you suggest that certainly if not in the immediate generation, then certainly in the next generation, that uh, the GDP is, is a net positive GDP, GDP contributor. Um, but the point, I think, I, if I may I, I jump on another point that, that is related to uh, something you said, where there's no question, leaving aside the UNHCR uh, or the Refugee Convention, I think generally uh, across the first world, we, we do have an issue at the moment about our, our goodwill around um, uh, how, how many displaced people and refugees that, that countries are willing to take in. Uh, um, and there is, you know, concerns around um, uh, uh, debt levels, um, you know, uh, terrorism. There's a whole range of things that's making things quite complicated out there uh, at the moment. There's one example I wouldn't, I'd like to refer the panel and the audience to, which is the Canadian experience, where um, they've got a program where uh, private individuals, can, well, individuals can privately sponsor. Uh, refugees, now that's uh, local sporting teams or families or community groups that get together. And in the Canadian experience, 27,000 Canadian dollars will sponsor uh, a family of refugees in, and you're responsible for the first year's uh, accommodation, food, and, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, medical needs of that family. You, so you reckon no that would work in Australia? I absolutely think it, it would work in Australia. Um, but what it does take is uh, government policy settings to enable uh, that to happen. Now, Australia's running a small pilot of that, which is different to the Canadian experience, but it's nonetheless allows um, s sponsor organisations like AIMS and, and, and uh, uh, NSSI to help refugees uh, sponsor and bring in um, uh, uh, extended families. But it's quite different because you're paying for $30,000 of uh, application fee, um, but once the extended family arrives, um, it's still back onto the government uh, uh, responsibility for the settlement program. The difference, and I think the magical thing about what the Canadians have done, is by broadening out the private sponsorship to all uh, 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 different segments of the community, you have, um, um, you're dealing with a culture of welcome rather than, a, than, than one where it's pushing people away. Um, you're actually engaging refugees uh, in the same way that, you know, I don't know, families who've hosted um, international students on the Rotary program, they're in your house. Hugh, let me just community. quickly interrupt. I want to just go back to Terry who asked the question. Listen to that, Terry. Um, do you think that, that sort of thing could work here? Would, would that sort of satisfy your problem that uh, people talking, are burdened? 
I think you're talking about small potatoes. You're not talking about the billions and possibly trillions of dollars that we're, we're already in debt. Where are we going to discharge? You've got to discharge the debt we have in the first place. Terry, the $10 billion we've just spent on sovereign <coughs> borders and the current, that is a significant amount of money that will continue to have to be spent year in, year out if we're going to maintain this policy. OK, Hugh, I'm going to go to uh, Jane. She was nodding here and I just want to hear quickly what she says. We're going to go yeah. to other questions I mean, as well. I think one of the misunderstandings is somehow that there's a fixed pie of wealth and that it has to be divided up more and more the more pe people we have. That's not true at all. The more people there are, the bigger the pie becomes. And that is borne out in all the research studies that have been done going back 30 years or more in Australia, which show that certainly when the first refugees arrive, they might need a little bit more support and assistance. But by the second generation, their kids are outperforming Australians on so many measures, including education, levels are higher than Australians and other migrants. Very often paid work and uh, voluntary work as well, scoring well above um, uh, you know, comparable cohorts. In Sweden, um, what's fascinating, Sweden has been the country per capita to take the largest number of refugees in Europe. And what they found is that even in the short term, their economy has grown by 4.5%. Um, Uganda, fantastic examples of refugees creating businesses, creating employment for locals as well as others. So this idea that somehow refugees are welfare dependent and are a drain on the economy is just not borne out in any of the evidence we have. The IMF has said, you know, the ref current refugee uh, movement into Europe is a very positive thing in terms of the economic benefit it will have over All right. time. Well, um, in terms of the positivity, you mentioned, uh, Hugh, earlier the issue of terrorism, the fear of terrorism. This question uh, addresses that in part. It's a video uh, from Bob de Haas in Bribey Island, Queensland. Jim, given your wide experience with combat veterans and also your experience with uh, the terrorist uh, situations, how can the government possibly risk importing in any way fighting age refugees, immigrants into our country, knowing that they can well be time bombs which could explode at any time in the future, just like our own veterans, which would have a severe impact on our own society? It's very hard to take combat out of a human. So what is the government going to do and what would you suggest? Jim Mullen. Bob, thank you, thank you for that. Bob, uh, I, I don't think the experience that we've had uh, of uh, uh, military aged males coming in has led to the conclusion that Bob makes. Uh, even when we had the Paris uh, terrorist attacks and the Brussels terrorist attacks, I think the estimates were made that of the million or so people who came in that year uh, unlawfully into Europe, uh, only 70 or so uh, were part of a jihadist Islamic extremist group that was bent on terrorism. So, uh, uh, Bob, I'm not, I'm not uh, more worried about these young men coming into Australia than I am about our own veterans. Uh, but what I would say is that I have been struck by the incongruity of a situation where we are sending our young men to Afghanistan and young Afghanistan men are coming to this country. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, 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 but uh, when I was in Iraq, we had something like 28 countries uh, that were part of the coalition in Iraq and about three quarters of them, in fact, uh, were countries who fought... For the, in rebellions against uh, kings and queens and dictators in various stages of their lives. Uh, there is a principle in uh, managing evacuees from uh, famine, flood, fire and war, and that is that you don't move them vast distances away from the source of the problem because when the problem's finished, it might be a good idea if they went home and rebuilt their own country. Uh, we can staff our own hospitals with good Syrian doctors, uh, but at some stage, Syria may need its doctors back. 
Bob, I don't have an answer any more than I have an answer for PTSD and our own soldiers. I don't think it's of the magnitude of the problem that you're suggesting or proportionally that bigger problem. OK, um, there is another question related to um, fear in the community and it comes from uh, Daniela, Danielle Abib. Thank you, Tony. Um, recently, a person jumped over the fence of my Muslim uh, girlfriend's house and cut the heads off her baby rabbits. She's subject to daily verbal abuse. She's spat at, she's worn out in front of her children, all because she's Muslim. Our political setting seems to be pushing a strong anti-Muslim sentiment through polls on Muslim immigration and senators with strong anti-Muslim rhetoric. Why are pollsters allowing to ask, allowed to ask such inflammatory questions? Uh, Shane, I'll start with you. Well, I think the issue is less that the pollsters are asking the questions, but that these opinions are allowed to permeate in our community. And I think you raise a really interesting point because you've got to ask the question, we have roughly around 500,000 people in this country of the Muslim faith. And the last polls indicated that 49% of of our nation, um, if you believe the polls, would like to see Muslims so-called banned from this country. I don't know what they're going to do with the people already here, but anyway. And the question you've got to ask is, if we've got a really tiny proportion of people in our country who are actually Muslim, how many people actually know a Muslim person and are basing their opinions on that Muslim person? And in fact, when you dig into those questions, and that's a question <coughs> pollsters should have asked, you find that the people who are least likely to know personally a Muslim person have the most severe opinions in opposition to that community. So then you ask the question, how do they know what they're talking about? And you've got to look then at politics and media because what is the fantasy that is being perpetuated to those communities about people they never know or never see? And that is the fundamental problem we've got here because ultimately those people with a big pulpit who are able to stand up there on tabloid newspapers and politicians and say basically false things and perpetuate a completely false notion of who people are in this country and what they're doing, they're responsible for the fear generation, not the actual Muslim person in our country who barely anybody knows anyway. A quick response to that, Jim. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with that. I don't think the, the, the issue is that you stop asking the question. Uh, we should ask ourselves uh, why it exists, as Danielle is asking. I, I think the question that was asked that 49% of people uh, uh, said that they agreed with was that uh, migration, from Muslim from, uh, uh, Muslim migration from Muslim countries should be stopped. And I think that uh, the pollster was so uh, surprised by the 49%. I've got to say, I wasn't surprised by it. The pollster was so surprised... Why were you back surprised? And, oh, uh, uh, I've just spent uh, the period of the uh, election campaign on the streets of this country, uh, all except three days I was out there assisting my country in my, in my brilliant but rather short political career. <laughs> uh, and... People would say to me from all sides of, of, of politics, and what, what did we get? We got 49% average. We got 60% of uh, coalition people saying that they supported this. 40% of Labor and 34% of the Greens. 34% of the Greens. I find that absolutely uh, credible because of the of what was put to me. I get both abused because of my involvement with Operation Sovereign Borders and thanked every day of the week. 70% of people still support it. But the pe the point that did I you, make. Did you find what you were hearing on the streets at all depressing? Uh, n no, I didn't. I think I was too, I was too either cold or busy to, to get too depressed about anything like that. But the, we're looking at the wrong point. We're saying that we should stop this. 49% in a, in a representative democracy, it would seem to me that we should take 49% of people who have views very, very seriously. We should ask why they've got them. And there is a perception that Muslims don't integrate. Shen is, 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 is telling us that they do. And, and my lived experience is that they do. There's no two ways about it. Uh, the other one, I think, is the big one, and that's a fear of terrorism. And that ain't, that ain't Pauline Hanson's fault. That is Islamic extremism, violence overseas coming into the TVs of least 49% of people who are quite concerned about it, and so we should let, be. Let me quickly it's go... not the Muslims, Jim, let, me, let, me, let me just quickly go back to our questioner uh, for a response to that. Uh, you, listening to that, uh, did you expect a different answer, first of all? Uh, no, I, I'm happy with, with the answer, but I'd really like to, to see the 49% if they actually do know a Muslim person, yeah, because I, I really... I mean, you, you've said yourself that um, you don't believe that 
you know, you, you'll be very much in support of, of what Sean said. So. OK, mm. we'll take that as a comment. We'll move on so that we can actually get to uh, more questions. We've got one from Larissa Mitchell. Here we go. <laughs> when um, we can get a microphone to you, we have now. Go ahead. I'm an e ESL support teacher at North Mead Kappa High School. I'm currently working with Year 12 asylum seeker students who arrived in boat in 2012. They are studying for their HSE exams, yet their worries about their future are whether they can remain in Australia permanently or not. They are currently holding bridging e visa E and will most likely transition to a temporary protection visa for three years or a safe haven enterprise visa for five years but they will never be able to apply for a permanent protection visa, leaving them in legal limbo, a state of uncertainty and un a doubtful for their futures. Jim Molan, what do you think is Australia's responsibility in ensuring that asylum seekers like my students can consider their futures with confidence in knowing that they will be able to call Australia their permanent and not temporary home. Jim, I'm going to just pause you on that one for a minute because I'd like to hear from some of the other panellists. And Jane, um, give us your perspective on this, first of all. Yeah, I mean, back in the, the first time that temporary protection visas were used um, when John Howard was Prime Minister, there was so much evidence as to the impacts they had on people's mental health, their inability to build a new life in Australia, living in constant fear that at the end of the expiry of that visa they might be sent home. I should make the point, by the way, that uh, there are a number of people in this audience, yeah. um, young people, who submitted questions to us and then withdrew them mm. because they were afraid that their temporary protection status would mm -hmm. be looked upon uh, badly by the government. So they've withdrawn questions. Uh, we've got a teacher who's asking the questions yeah, on their behalf. It's very telling. I mean, that's the, the sense of insecurity that people have. To put people in this limbo status is cruel and furthermore, to deny them ever the possibility of reuniting with family members is perhaps the worst cruelty you could visit upon any person. Perhaps counterintuitively, but something that the government knows all too well, is when you grant people permanence, that is the time that they may take up an opportunity when it does become safe to return to their country and try and rebuild because they've got that safety net. But without it, people are living in this constant state of fear. And, I mean, Do you know how many, of... how many people are we talking about? Sorry, in, in living Australia? in Wisconsin. Well, yeah. at the moment, we've got around 30,000 people who are either on bridging visas or temporary protection visas. And it's a wasted generation. I mean, you think about the fact that many of these people were detained for years and years. These are people who are uh, perhaps only just being able to access proper education. Whether they can go on to university, they, they're charged full uh, international fees unless the universities waive those fees. It is really, it's not setting up anybody for a good future, whether that future is built in Australia, back in the country that they came from or anywhere else. All right, let's hear brief answers from this side of the panel. Frank. First, thank you, thank you, thank you for being the teacher you are and the voice for the voiceless. That's what the country needs. Now. In terms of the issue, these were set up as deterrents because prior to 2013 there had been an influx of boat people. As Jim has told us, and he's the authority, they're now safely and legally turning them back. Though we might question that, but that's what he says is happening. Given that, there's now no need for that. And it's un-Australian. I say it's un-Australian for this reason. We're very different from a country like the United States, which is very used to having low-paid illegal workers. We as Australians have always said, yep, we have secure borders, and guess what? Part of having secure borders is everyone within these borders is entitled to decent welfare, decent job opportunities, and decent education opportunities. And to be creating second-order Australians is a disgrace. And there's no benefit for it because, as we're told, the votes are stopped. And, incidentally, um, you came to the conclusion not so long ago that stopping the votes was the right thing to do. I came to the conclusion that given that people are not fleeing directly from persecution in Indonesia and given that we have a situation where we have a commitment to a robust humanitarian program, then I would accept stopping of the boats provided what was going on was transparent and I could be convinced that it was safe and legal. And, and definitely... If there be any people, if we ever have a situation in Indonesia 
where people are d fleeing directly from persecution in that country, then I would say all bets are off. OK. Uh, now, just, just the, 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 all bets are off. You're exactly right in relation to people coming out of, of places like, uh, uh, like Irian. Uh, but to think that there is no need for the, 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 the uh, policy of Operation Sovereign Borders now is just basically wrong. Well, how, about the, us... how about... Let's go to the question sure. specifically. Um, we're being asked What's by that? a teacher uh, whether temporary protection visas uh, are... Uh, working or whether they're actually negative and having poor consequences. Uh, and, I, and I will, but could we talk about the need at some stage before we all go we, home? Yeah, we can, we because can do that's that. key. Yes. Uh, it is. It's, it's very, very hard and it's very awful policy. Uh, and the only consolation I could make, and I, the only consolation I could offer you, is that the consequences for people coming to this country as IMAs, illegal maritime arrivals, or flying in to end up on temporary protection visas is what Operation Sovereign Borders had, has achieved. No deaths at seas, the boats going back, 17 centres closed, no children in Jim, in I'm going to interrupt you because you're saying no deaths at uh, sea, but here's a, a, a questioner who says there are deaths in Australia. Uh, Shikufa Tahiri. Uh, my father came to Australia on a boat in 1999 while I myself came to Australia as a refugee in 2006. Um, as someone who works with the Refugee Council of Australia and as someone who works really closely with the refugee communities, I see the aftermath of government policies unfold and manifest itself in the communities in Australia. A kind of endemic that's unfolding itself before the nation's eyes. Uh, detention, temporary protection visas, a lack of family reunion, citizenship delays, um, lack of certainty, prolonged delays in processing, are driving people into self-harm and suicide. In the Hazara community alone, in the past 12 months, there have been six cases of suicide and self-harm. Um, my question is to Jim Mullen. Um, to stop the boat, is it necessary and is it worthy to push these asylum seekers, the 30,000 of them in Australia, to such extent? Is it worthy to do that just in order to stop the boats? Uh. Keep it brief, Jim, because we want to hear from other panellists too. Sorry. I, 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 I don't connect the two. You can connect the two. I don't connect the two. I mean, it hang on a sec. Temporary protection visas are part of the system. Oh, right? absolutely. A key part of the system. Because if you come illegally to this country, uh, you must not benefit from coming illegally because regardless of... So, what, so, what... Well, so can we just... <laughs> we'll go back because you are connecting the two, aren't you? Why? Right, Tell us why. Right. So in order to stop the boat... What I'm asking is, is it necessary to punish the 30,000 asylum seekers who are already in Australia with us here in our community, who are, if given a chance, can resettle into the country successfully, like my family did, like thousands of other families did back in the early 2000s? Shakufa, can you explain, are you making a connection between the suicides in your community that you've seen and the policy? That's what we're trying to get to Correct. the Correct. Um, I think that um, the rate of suicide and the rate of self-harm is a direct result of the policies that are being uh, imposed on them, uh, the kind of policies that they're being subjected to. It is the, the endemic result of prolonged delays, prolonged uncertainty, prolonged um, uncertainty when adults cannot make decisions for their lives in the next two or three years. OK, before we come back to you, Jim, sure. I want to hear from others. So, um, Hugh. Look, I think Jim makes a very uh, clear point that the, the pillars of the sovereign borders, uh, including temporary protection visas, are critical for stopping the boats, right? I think you've sort of repeated that point several times. I guess the question facing us as a, as a country and, and, and our policy makers, is there a better way of doing this, OK? There's no... No one is in favour of people drowning at sea, no one. Um, but when you take $10 billion, you take the ramifications of what the current policies uh, in the way it's stacked up and you take the ingenuity that I think collectively we as a country ought to have, is there a more effective way of doing this? The Labor Party thought there was and look what happened. No, I don't think, with all due respect is. to the Sh Labor Party... Sh 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 Shen's just done uh, something called the Gribble Argument. Um, you've addressed this question. Um, give us a brief, a brief, <laughs> if you can, um, <laughs> version of why you say there is an alternative. 
Well, I think there's an alternative because when you understand that we take 800,000 people a year and we have done so since Prime Minister John Howard, the highest intake in history, it's because we know it turbocharges our economy and contributes uh, to our 800, society. So, 800,000 per year. Migrants. This right. shouldn't be news to you. No. 800,000 per year. No. 200,000. This is the problem. Because of the limitations of year. knowledge. Permanent. Because, because of the limitations of knowledge from some of the people who were the architects of sovereign boards, and I include the Labor Party because they should have come up with it themselves, they asked the question without knowing the tools we have available. Now, Hugh is completely right. If the problem is people taking a dangerous journey and if we have people in our detention centres who tried every formal way and we blocked them, why don't we just use the available tools we have? Why don't we open up existing migration pathways? Why don't we use some of that $10 billion and throw it towards giving some stability and processing in the region? It would barely touch the sides. We could throw a billion dollars at it in aid. It wouldn't touch the sides of the spend of what we're currently doing now. We could do all of those things and it's been demonstrated both historically in our own current experience and elsewhere across the world that it would work. And the question we've got now is, why can't we have the conversation about doing better? I'm not going to say every single one of these things will work in and of itself, but, Jim, if there's a way of doing this better, if we don't need to spend $10 billion, if we don't need the suicides of people, if we don't need child abuse, would you be willing to come to the table and talk about it? Talk Absolutely. about a possibility. Right, Absolutely. I'll take you up on that. Absolutely, and, and, and we have... Come to a summit. You're my first invite. Absolutely, and bring Malcolm ladies and Turnbull gentlemen. with you. And this is, this is not an academic activity for me. I have done this for real. I have done this from first principles and gone through and produced something which works. There is a cost, but it works. It has saved lives and it's restored the faith of the Australian people in their migration policy, which is 200,000 people per year, 192,000 people per year. That completely ignores all of the temporary uncapped migration that John Howard was the architect for, which is Can, can we just go, the fact-checkers are going to be uh, all over Absolutely. this one. Do. <laughs> is there anyone who can um, shed a light on this side of the table on these figures that we're talking about? 800,000 a year sounds like so, an extraordinary Yeah, I mean, if I could amount, also just take the point that I don't think it's an academic experience for Shakufa or for Hugh or for all and other I'm people who have been And I'm not saying it was. I'm saying it wasn't for me. I said it was a real experience okay. for me. All right, fair enough. Well, I think in terms of the figures, it would be that the 192,000 cover those who migrate to Australia permanently, some on business visas, some on family reunions, some on humanitarian. Now, I take it that Shen's point is there are another 600,000. I didn't know there were so many. Mm. But they come on all sorts of temporary visas. They're here for a short term to do a bit of business or pay years, a visit to people years. and then they go home. Well, they don't necessarily. At this right. point in time, there were 1.5 million temporary migrants who've been here for a number of years in this country. But I think it goes well, the greatest to... overstayers have always been the Brits. Yes, but they're not, they're not even... The point, Shen, I think, you is... saying that this... It, when you hear Pauline Hanson say we're being overrun, mm -hmm. is she looking um, at this broader picture. I'm looking around, I'm seeing a lot of people who aren't from Australia. That's her view. And I think this is part of our political problem we've got here. This shouldn't be news to, to people on the panel, especially not Jim Nolan. And what we've had, and what we've had quietly, and that's why I term it the, the great con in the speech, is that we've had an incredible migration program uh, over the last 15 years that has gone under the radar. And politicians haven't wanted to tell us because they haven't been brave enough to say it's incredible, it's successful, it's needed for this country. And the great irony is we sit here as a community, many, I can see in the faces in the audience, many people, migrants in the audience, migrants no doubt on the table here, and we demonise people who come here seeking a better life when most of us did anyway. What is so wrong with that? What is wrong is when people come in a dangerous way and what is wrong is when we don't have a managed orderly process. But if we can do it for 800,000 people right now, then I dare say we could do it for 25,000 others, which was the hype of who came during the boat arrival. OK, Jim. Well, I see what you're saying now. I understand you're 800,000 people. I don't see the relevance of it in relation to this. There is a pathway now which is working, which is getting bigger. The fact that we had Operation Sovereign Borders allowed us it is a pro-migration policy. It allowed, it, it allowed us to expand 
the, uh, uh, the intake, not just to the 18,750 that I talk about that is now permanent, but to the 12,000 Syrians anyhow. So, just very briefly, and I just want to go back to the question that was asked earlier, because did, I didn't get to come back to you to respond to the idea that people are actually killing themselves out of despair in this country. Uh, that's what was suggested there. Now, if that were the case, if that could be proven, would you rethink your support of the temporary protection arrangements? Well, we, we have uh, a good Hazaras who have, co who's come from in, who have come from uh, Afghanistan uh, on the basis that they had a well-founded fear of persecution and we're saying their trauma is because of uh, our policy. You know, uh, I would need that to be justified to me. Uh, well, we've still got our questioner there. Do you think you can justify it? Um, well, within the Hazara culture in Afghanistan, despite uh, the very, you know, precarious situation in Afghanistan, suicide is not a norm in, in Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, it, people wonder, people are somewhat bewildered in Australia, this endemic type of and the, um, suicide is happening in the community in the last 12 months. And I think that it's the kind of uncertainty, it's a kind of um, restriction that they're facing that drives them uh, to such extent of self-harm and suicide. I mean, I consult with uh, communities really closely and I in fact heard from an Adelaide community member, a Hazara person, saying that um, I am woken up in the middle of the night um, by someone banging their head on the wall and I ask them what's happening, what's wrong with you and they tell me that I don't know what to do with my life. My family is trapped in a war-torn country and I'm here stuck in a processing limbo. What should I do? I I'm going to. Uh, I'm just going to throw that to for final comments, really, to uh, the rest of the panel on this side because we are pretty much out of time. So, Hugh, uh, uh, um, whether you can directly connect suicide, you've got to um, look at the circumstances and believe that the level of depression, and despair from not being able to build your life has to be real. Okay, I don't think anyone can deny that. And the question is, why do we do that? Um, when um, different solutions exist. Um, you said before, Jim, that if we, if we set up a regional uh, uh, facility in uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, that it would uh, lead to millions coming down this way. Not necessarily the case, particularly if we take some of those billions of dollars and invest it in, in building up the infrastructure and camps and processing facilities, facilities closer to the source country where, no, where they you. are, like Jordan no. or Pakistan, OK? No. So that's one thing. Second thing is that by put, bringing money and a vision to the table, we can arm wrestle Japan and South Korea and other countries in our region to participate in the solution. Because right now we're pushing everyone away I and mean, this is where we are. Now, you know, you might say, yeah, that's naive. But I think if you're actually um, talking to the people who work at UNHCR and other NGOs around the area, I think people are looking for a solution. And off the back of that, Australia, through a combination of government-sponsored refugees and private-sponsored refugees, we can probably increase our uptake, uptake north of 30,000 a year, plus add to that the other pathways that are available through, through these 800,000. And we then start to build the next generation of workforce and people who really want to make a contribution. And getting back to Terry's point, that's how we go part of the way in solving our budget and, de and deficit problem, right? We need people who are going to be net contributors to the country and people who are really motivated to build a life okay, for themselves. OK, we need brief answers from our last panellists. Thank you. Whenever we commit troops to war in places like Afghanistan, we Australians should then extend special privilege to those who flee persecution from those theatres of war, and we should do it for at least twice the length of time that we leave our troops there, because our troops are there in what we think to be the national interest, and so we should look to your interests as well. Okay. If refugees waited for the so-called solution that Jim is proposing, they would be waiting over 150 years before the current situation would be resolved. That's the kind of solution which really is no answer whatsoever. In 1949, 48% of Australia's overall migration intake were refugees, and that helped build Australia into the nation that it is today. So why don't we give a fair go to the refugees today who need our help and also help turn Australia into an even more flourishing, prosperous country? Well, Jim, I'll give you the final word. Um, it'll have to be brief, but really the question for you, I suppose, is listening to this. Um, do you find any reason at all to moderate, change, alter your views? 
For two reasons, Tony, no. The first reason is that the need exists now. Operation Sovereign Borders going into the future is the new normal. There are 14,000 people waiting for weakness on our part to cross, to cross, uh, in, to, to, for the people smugglers to sell them to cross into Australia. First, so that's the first point, need. We need Operation Sovereign Borders and that's the new normal. Uh, the second point is that no one should ever think that Australia is not doing its bit in relation to this. We heard today, those of you who had the pleasure of listening to the Trump uh, uh, Clinton debate today, that silly old Trump criticised Clinton for increasing the US refugee intake from 10,000 to 65,000. The US is only taking 10,000 per year. I was absolutely astonished at that. We are the third largest taker of permanent set, uh, settlers in the world. We are leading the world. No Australian should feel uh, embarrassed about what we're doing for refugees in the world. Um, I'm going to have to uh, leave the discussion there. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Jim Molan, uh, Shen Narayana Sama, Sami, uh, Jane McAdam, uh, Frank Brennan and Hugh Trong. Thank you. So, uh, next Monday, Q&A will be live from Melbourne, and uh, we'll see you then. Good night.